All right. So thank you guys for coming tonight. Tonight we're talking about the invasive plant, the Asian bush honeysuckle. Um, before we dive into that, though, first let me introduce myself. My name is Bob Bruner. I am the A&R Extension Educator for Clay and Owen Counties, and I've left my contact information at the end of our presentation in case you want to get a hold of me. Uh, but like I said, tonight we're doing the Asian bush honeysuckle. Uh, this is a nasty plant. It is definitely challenging to try to remove, and I want to share a couple stories with you first. One of them is that in my county, I have the great joy of having McCormick's Creek State Park there, and this is an absolutely gorgeous park. Um, one of the reasons I'm bringing it up, though, is because for the last several years, they've been working diligently to remove all honeysuckle from their area. It was so dense when I originally started working in Owen County that you could not walk through good part portions of the forest. It was just completely locked down with honeysuckle. And they put forward a huge amount of effort to remove it. Another thing I wanted to share with you that I thought was particularly pertinent to tonight was one of the things I do is I visit client properties to help advise them on how to manage their land. And this morning, I went to a gentleman's property who had bush honeysuckle all over it, and he was wanting to know how to get rid of it. It had spread incredibly far from a single source point and covered quite a few acres of the area. And I thought that was really interesting given what we're talking about tonight. So the first thing I wanna cover, and this is a little bit of a bulky presentation as compared to normal, is I wanna talk a lot about what invasive plants are and how you can approach managing invasive plants. So first question is, is that we need to ask ourselves, what constitutes an invasive plant? You probably heard plenty through news and other sources about this is invasive, that is invasive. But what does that actually mean for us? Well, an invasive plant is an exotic species. This is a species that is not native to our environment. It occurs and it is occurring here around us outside of its natural range. Normally, in fact, almost always, it's brought here through human activity. An invasive plant, the reason it is so awful is that it becomes established in a new environment which has no natural checks and balances to its presence, which means it then outcompetes all the other native species. And I'm going to show you a few examples of this in a moment. So not only does it outcompete our native species, but it also generally reduces our biodiversity, which means that the abundance of different species is going to drop down all of a sudden where you may have seen 30, 40 different species of plants and animals. It's going to go down because that native plant is just choking out the other opportunities for different species to be there and absorbing all the niches in the environment for them to occupy. Not only that, but if you want to come down to where it's really going to impact us human beings, it endangers our agricultural production as well. Uh, invasive species can do quite a bit of damage on agricultural lands with their presence. So let's talk about that competition aspect first. So what I'm showing you right now is not actually an invasive species. It's one that we introduced. This is known as the multicolored Asian lady beetle. This insect was actually intentionally brought here to the United States in the early 60s uh, in order to fight aphid infestations in the nut industry. Um, the, we were about to lose our pecan industry and a few other nut industries because of the aphid infestations they experienced. Well, a lot of ecologists got together and decided that this insect would be excellent to serve in our environment as a biocontrol agent, and they were right. They released this insect and it's, it did its job beautifully. It actually saved those industries. But now if you look around, almost every single lady beetle you see is a multicolored Asian lady beetle because they've adapted to our environment so well. And while I haven't personally seen research myself on how much it's pushed out different lady beetle species, given the fact that I no longer see a lot of our native red and pink lady beetles that I would have expected to, I see these all the time now. And that's an example of species most likely outcompeting each other for space and resources. And this is just from something that really doesn't damage our environment at all. This is another terrific example of competition eliminating natives. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the American South at all, but it has a huge kudzu problem. I lived for a few years in Mississippi where a lot of this is just absolutely out of control. And this picture doesn't even begin to tell the story. 
Um, kudzu was originally brought here. It is invasive. Um, we didn't know, or the person who introduced it, didn't realize the impact it was going to have on the environment. Kudzu will spread everywhere. It will cover power lines. It will cover houses. It will cover trees that are still living. And it looks just like this. You'll see just fields and fields of kudzu covering everything. And this is a prime example of the kind of damage that an invasive species can do here. Uh, Japanese stilt grass is another good one. A lot of the areas that I had the opportunity to study, um, forest understories would get infested with Japanese stilt grass, which would choke out all other understory plants. And this is an example of the reduction in biodiversity that we experience. Now, I'm showing you a picture of a nice, healthy looking cornfield right now because I want to talk about what biodiversity means for a moment. So our cornfields and our other fields like soybeans, et cetera, are extremely vital to us. We need these to grow our food. We need them. Um, however, nature abhors a monoculture. Monocultures do not naturally exist except in extreme instances. Nature tends towards biodiversity and competition. Um, when you have a monoculture, the ecosystem that it exists in is not very resilient at all. If there's some kind of disturbance, that ecosystem will not be able to recover from it very easily. So changes that happen within it, like say a forest fire or a flooding event could mean the end of that ecosystem. It doesn't have the built-in resistance to it that biodiversity provides. When you introduce invasive species, that limits that biodiversity and it limits that ecosystem's capacity to be able to resist those changes. This one I thought was a particularly really good example of what happens when you actually manage an invasive species. So what you're seeing here is a European dune grass infestation in the 90s. And this is an, a picture, and I apologize for the quality of it, um, that just shows you the areas just absolutely covered in dune grass. Well, the managers of this space decided that they were going to go ahead and work on eradicating this invasive species from the area. And what resulted was the area suddenly just exploded with different species. You can see several different species of flower, lots of different scrub plants covering these areas. And all of a sudden, this is a brand new fully operational ecosystem. You know, it's, it's there, it's going to have lots of different species, it's going to support all kinds of life. So you can imagine when you eliminate things like bush honeysuckle from forest understory, what's going to happen when you begin this kind of work. Invasive species, like I mentioned earlier, also have the capacity to threaten our agriculture. They will outcompete the plants that we put in the ground because we have essentially designed these plants to exist within a very particular environment. And unfortunately, a lot of these invasives are also very, very resistant to herbicides because they keep getting treated with it and develop resistance to it very easily. So a lot of our invasives now, things that we call invasive, I should say, may actually be considered naturalized species. However, when they get introduced to different environments, they could be considered invasive. So if you move one plant that may be, say, native in Indiana, but you put it in a different kind of ecosystem and it explodes, that's when you have a problem. Think of an instance where you decide to plant mint in your garden. Mint is a native of Indiana. It's a plant that people grow all the time. However, mint has a tendency to take over everything when it gets planted. You actually have to manage it because it's a resilient plant it'll come back year after year until the sun goes black and it's just become, it'll become a problem if you don't manage that plant. Some of the things that are also a part of the issues that we deal with with invasive species, especially in agriculture, but not only in agriculture, is that we have a lack of new molecules. And what that means is we lack a lot of the herbicide capacity to handle them. There are several herbicides on the, molecule, on the market, but there are only a few of those that actually use different active ingredients. And since we're only producing active ingredients at a very slow rate, we may not be able to produce enough of them to manage all of the resistance that's developing in these plants and other species. So that is something that, especially if you're a farmer, you're going to understand very, very well. 
So let's address the question of how do invasive species get here? And English ivy makes a great example of this one. English ivy is a plant that we brought here intentionally because a lot of people love the way it looks as a part of landscaping. I don't know if any of you have been a part of the fight against English ivy, but it is um, awful if you try to remove it from a property. Uh, the house that I live in right now, the previous owner loved English ivy as a part of her landscaping. And unfortunately, my wife and I have been working for the last three years to remove English ivy from our property because it just spreads everywhere. It'll get under the siding of your house and it will just take over everything. Now, invasive species, almost without exception, and even that may be untrue. It may just be entirely due to human activity. Whether we ship something from overseas by accident, for example, emerald ash borer was shipped in pallets that we didn't realize it was in, and then it spread across the states, or it's shipped through land transport. Say we ship it across the country in semi-trucks. I would also add on here that um, boating activity in different lakes can spread invasive species. If you think about the zebra mussel as a part of the Great Lakes, um, you can find a lot of examples. Now, one of the things that I also would mention too is just that contact from human beings on our clothing when we go hiking in areas where they're invasives can help spread this due to seeds and other things. So unfortunately, we make really great carriers of this stuff and we need to monitor ourselves much more closely if we wanna try to eradicate these eventually. The other thing or the other way that it spreads is we sell invasive species as a part of landscaping. Um, I know I won't make any friends with this, but things like burning bush are invasive. They, can, they may look great in your yard, but you know what? They will spread their seeds all over the place and you'll find whole forest filled with burning bush now. Burning bush is just one example of this. Winter creeper is also another example that you can find in different places. Japanese honeysuckle, the big one that we're going to be talking about in a little bit here, is one that has been saleable before within the States. And of course, my old enemy, the calorie pear or the Bradford pear. So I live in Terre Haute, Indiana. And if you've ever been in Terre Haute, you know that people here love their calorie pear. And unfortunately, this tree has spread a lot of places. Um, I found places outside of the city where calorie pear has just taken over fields areas. Um, and it's starting to push out other native trees. And I absolutely hate this one because it smells awful if you get near a calorie pear at the right time of year. So what I would also counsel you guys to do, and I'm sure a lot of you are already doing this and are already talking to people about it, is watch what you purchase. Remember that the plants that you buy are not just limited to your yard. Plants will pollinate and they will spread their seeds through human and animal activity. They can be wind pollinated and they can spread it through that way. And some species may even outcompete your own grass, depending on what is around you. So what do we do to manage for these plants? Now, I've got a few different slides coming up here, and I've just marked out the names of different species I'm going to show you, so that way you guys can see examples of them uh, before we get to our bush honeysuckle portion. So this one, of course, uh, vinca or common periwinkle is also an invasive, and you can buy this one very, very easily. So the big advice that I want to give you right now is we, foc we tend to focus on plants, but we need to consider managing for the land and not necessarily for the plant itself. And this great thing here, this was produced by the Nature Conservancy, lists a way of trying to manage your goals for this in order to manage invasive species within a landscape. So it starts with the first part here, establishing conservation targets and goals. And this can be taken from the macro to the micro scale too. You can apply this to your own property or your own yard, or if you work for a large organization, of course, applying it to landscapes you work within. The second part here is identifying and prioritizing species and different infestations. Now, you guys are really, really lucky. Um, Almost all of you live in a county where there is an extension educator, just like me, who you can call to identify whatever is on your property. This is our job. This is what we do. And for those of you who may be out of state here, um, a lot of the states around us have extension services, and you can call into extension offices nearby you across the state line, or you can just call me, and I'm happy to direct you to our specialists or work with you to help you solve your problems. 
The next thing that the Nature Conservancy recommends is assessing your control techniques. The reason I bring this up is because not all control methods are equal. Not all herbicides are going to work the same way against all plants. Not all plants are going to respond the same way to different mechanical controls. So you need to research the plant. Once you've done your research, you need to develop and implement some kind of weed management plan and then monitor and assess the actual results of what you do. And then based on those results, modify what you're doing to create a better system that you're working from, basically perfecting what you do. The thing that a lot of people don't understand is as you begin to manage invasives, you are entering into a multi-year project. I have yet to hear of any invasive species that was removed within a year without a serious budget and serious effort. And even then, there's still a seed bank in the ground that's gonna come back up the following year. Asian bush honeysuckle, in this case, is an extreme project. Uh, whether you have one on your property or if you have 50 of them, they're never easy to remove. And it's gonna take time and it's gonna take effort to make sure that they don't come back after you cut them down the first time. So the things to consider for your targets and goals, this may be more important to some of you than others. Um, are you planning for aesthetics or are you planning for conservation? So are you, basically, are you managing a yard or are you trying to create a better woodland for yourself to pass down to your kids or something like that? Is there a particular plant or set of plants that you're looking to maintain? Um, unfortunately, some of us may not have the budget to be able to manage every single invasive species on our property, so you may need to narrow those goals down. You may need to manage for what you can actually afford to do and the time and energy you have to put in. You also need to ask, are there ways to increase your biodiversity on your property? Invasive species win by outcompeting things, but if you can assist the natural biodiversity in your area in winning that competition, you can really start that fight up and get those invasive species to not come back once you've removed them. And I kind of talked about this a little bit already. Identification is the hardest part when it comes to these. It's often ignored. People will often choose to say, well, I'm just going to spray it with Roundup and hopefully that'll do the job. But there are lots of reasons why you need to identify these. If you've ever been a master gardener, you know that we harp on this a lot. Um, like I said, not all control methods are equal and it's gonna be dependent on the plant. The other thing to consider when you are managing for an invasive species is prioritize. I put the joke in here, dandelions aren't a threat if you're trying to manage your yard. So you need to know which plants actually do represent a threat to you. Know which ones are actually going to be that competition issue. There are going to be people who are going to want to plant things that are non-native. And you need to decide, okay, if I have a non-native plant here, is this thing actually going to cause me a problem? Or is it just going to sit in its nice little spot where I can enjoy it? The other thing, um, of course, is to identify all the pest plants and invasives because you need to know what to hurt, basically. You wanna make sure that you know what you're gonna be applying herbicide to and how you're gonna be doing it. You also need to know what isn't a problem because if you accidentally just do a mass spray, you might be eliminating things that could help you out in the long run. Other portions of prioritization that I would mention is choosing where to start your work. Um, this is gonna be based on your capacity for being able to get to those plants and how you wanna approach it. So one thing that I would share here using that McCormick's Creek example that we started with is their infestation was so thick you couldn't walk into it, which means that they had to choose where to start and they had to choose probably to use a lot of mechanical assistance or equipment to get into those areas. Um, that means that they, they had to either use something like a skid steer to assist them with spraying or removal activities or a lot of chainsaw work. And these are things that you're going to want to consider. You're also going to want to consider which species to go after first. If you have things like uh, English ivy on your property, but you also have bush honeysuckle surrounding the edges, which one is going to represent the greater threat to what you're doing? Which one do you want to eliminate first? In my opinion, the English ivy can be cut down with a little bit of work to just put it off for the moment. Not to say you're gonna ignore it, but put that on the second level of priority. 
whereas the bush honeysuckle is really hard to remove if it's allowed to spread. So that one would be higher on my list of priority. You're probably going to have to use some kind of combination to work out when you're going to get to things and how you're going to get to them. And it's going to take a combination of control methods as well. No, there is no silver bullet here. There is not going to be any one way that's going to work for everyone. It's going to be based on what you have on your property, what's the structure of your property, and what do you have available to you. So this is something that I actually help our state parks with. I actually, I'm a drone pilot. I, I am licensed by the FAA to fly a drone for commercial and educational reasons. And I use my drone at uh, our state parks to help map out invasive species spread. And we share that information with them so they can do their work and we can see where we need to go with what they're doing. You don't necessarily need a drone to do what you need to do, but at least create a map so you know how you're making progress. Um, and that way you also can tell areas that have not yet been invaded and you can monitor them for signs of invasion. Um, think about just mapping these things out over time. You can easily tell when stuff is starting to shift. The idea is to unfragment boundaries of invaded areas. So you are trying to eliminate habitat fragmentation created by these invasive species. Once you reconnect the natural habitat, that competition effect is going to start back up and the whole environment's going to start getting probably more ideal for what you want. And from an eco ecological standpoint, it's going to become healthier and more resilient. And of course, I've already talked a little bit about this. Um, you need to see what's nearby. It's not yet in sight of interest though. Uh, you need to see if there's gonna be something that could encroach upon your property soon. You need to see what is currently present and of course prioritize based on which species are going to be more important to you. And obviously the ones that are gonna have a higher priority are the ones who are going to be expanding inwards at a faster rate. Those are the ones that you're going to probably be working, working the most on at the start. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our control techniques. So here's a great picture of Chinese privet. This is a nasty one that people still plant sometimes and I wish I could get them to stop. All right, so there are a lot of different control techniques. Almost every single invasive species, and this is very true for Asian bush honeysuckle, the best control technique is physical removal. Um, it is backbreaking labor, unfortunately. It takes a lot of digging, chainsawing, um, and a lot of other methods to try to rip this stuff out. I was visiting a gentleman earlier today, like I mentioned earlier, who told me how he had ripped out bush honeysuckle and he had a bobcat that he was using to rip it out. Um, cultural changes in your land management. The idea here is you don't want open spaces on your land. If there's not something growing in it and you're worried about an invasive species, that's a spot where you need to worry. It's going to come in there eventually if it's encroaching into your area. And also, of course, the use of herbicides. Unfortunately, there is not going to be an instance where herbicides don't, aren't called for, unfortunately. If you have bush honeysuckle, most of the time you probably are going to be treating it with an herbicide. There just isn't another good method short of physically ripping it out yourself, which like I said, is incredibly labor intensive. Make a plan. Do not attempt to do this without making some kind of plan for yourself, even, it's, even if it's the most basic plan you can think of. And here's an example, of course, of winged burning bush. Like I said, I know I probably won't make any friends with this one, but this is another invasive and it does spread even if you don't think it is. Trust me, I have seen forests that are covered in this stuff because someone nearby thought it looked good in their landscaping. Please don't buy this plant. So what I want you to focus on with your plan is review your control methods and evaluate how successful they were was it an ideal to try to physically remove them? Or would you be able to do well with using something like a basil bark treatment? Or if you use a basil bark treatment and it didn't work, then evaluate it. Do you need to do cut stump? Do you need to do something else? You're gonna be modifying these efforts over time. And yes, it is going to take time. You're gonna you're going be settling in for the long haul here. Okay, so some information that you guys are definitely waiting for our Asian bush honeysuckle, the great enemy as I sometimes call it. This stuff is an extremely resilient plant. 
They spread very, very easily. They're easily identified because um, they're usually some of the first plants to green up and they are the last ones to lose their green color. Uh, so they will stick out in a forest understory very, very easily. They have dark egg-shaped leaves with white tubular flowers, and that can vary sometimes with color morphs and different hybridizations that may happen in the plant. But for the most part, I find that they have white tubular flowers. They will usually be in an upright bush that can be anywhere between six and 15 feet of height. So these can be very large plants and they are woody. So that means they can also be very, very tough plants as well. They usually occupy the understory of forests and they can be extremely dense. Um, they may not necessarily get as bad as say multiflora rose, but they can still be very dense. They can make it very, very difficult to move in and out of an area if they're left to their own devices. And like I said, they're the first to leaf out and the last to decline. Another thing of note here is that bush honeysuckle may also release a chemical inhibitor into the soil intended to prevent competitors from being close to them. This is something that we see with uh, tree species too. If you try to grow things underneath trees, you'll notice that plants tend to die. Well, that's because some trees will uh, emit things into the soil. For example, our black walnut likes to emit a chemical called juggalone into the soil that will prevent anything else from growing in it. Asian bush honeysuckle has a similar adaptation, I'm afraid. Okay, so our different control methods here. Now let's talk about mechanical control first. And you've heard me say this a couple of times now. Removing the plants physically can work and it may not necessarily be as bad if the plants are small. But if the plants are no longer small, if they're getting to that four foot, three foot height, you're talking a root system that's going to be fairly extensive at that point. And if the plants are also spreading, they can grow too dense to be able to successfully remove them from just uh, trying to remove them yourself with a shovel, at that point, you're looking at using a skid steer or a tractor to try to pull them out to try to uh, thin out that thicket of Asian bush honeysuckle so you can begin to work with them. So ultimately, what I usually see as the end point of management for these plants is normally some kind of chemical application. And I imagine most people who work with Asian bush honeysuckle would agree with me. Um, and it's unfortunate because uh, herbicides, they don't have friends, they don't discriminate on who they're going to affect. So you could potentially damage local plants, but the invasive species are just simply far too damaging on their own not to use an herbicide to try to control them. Foliar spray methods are one of the ones that um, are probably the most recognized. They're ones that are probably the most thought of. Uh, this is easy to do when the plants are in reach. If you've got plants here and there and not necessarily a dense group of them, foliar spraying works. You're going to want to spray these to just simply wet the foliage. This is the important part. You don't wanna soak them. If you soak them, you're gonna risk damaging other plants. Now the best time to use a foliar spray for Asian bush honeysuckle is when it's beginning to enter late fall. The trees and other sensitive plants in the area have either gone through dieback or into dormancy. So that way, any herbicide that you spray really isn't going to affect them because the bush honeysuckle is still going to be nice and green. So there's an instance where using that foliar spray method is going to work for you. Now, this, uh, this herbicide recommendation here comes from Ohio, the Ohio State University, I should say, and they have a few choices here that they list. So uh, for one here, glyphosate is one of the number one recommendations here, and they have a few brand names, Roundup, Accord, and they recommend using something that's at least 41% glyphosate. 2,4-D with triclopyr under the brand name Crossbow is also one that they recommend that's effective uh, for going with wetting the foliage and stems using their uh, formulation there, and also triclopyr in the Garlon and Tahoe brand names. Now, one thing I'm going to say here is that I have seen a few um, contradictory statements on the use of triclopyr when it comes to Asian bush honeysuckle. Some organizations are going to say that triclopyr doesn't appear to have good efficacy on the plant. I personally have not done that research myself. So what I would say is that if you choose to use triclopyr, I would analyze how well it's going. 
I would definitely keep records of how effective it's going to be because if it's not looking effective to you, then you need to choose a different molecule in that case. Okay, moving right along. So in foliar methods, mist spraying is also an option that has been recommended by some, but how yet need to keep in mind, mist spraying can be indiscriminate. You need to make sure that when you apply using a mist sprayer, that you're doing it at the right time. So if you try to apply this around dawn or dusk, right when the sun is rising or setting, you are experience, experiencing a moment where there's something called a temperature inversion. And that means that the layers of cold and warm air are forming uh, over each other in such a way that if you spray a mist, it's just gonna hover in the air, which means it could drift very easily off targets. So if you choose to do this, you need to be a little bit careful and monitor your application to make sure it doesn't drift. You don't wanna accidentally cause damage to other places on your property or your neighbor's property. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cut stump herbicide treatments. This is one that's fairly effective. So this is a method of painting or spraying herbicide on an exposed cut stump in order to kill the plant after you cut it close to the ground. Normally the herbicides are mixed with either, um, they're either water soluble or they're oil, they're mixed with an oil, so they're oil soluble herbicides. But when you do this, you need to keep in mind that whether you choose water or oil, the timing is key. This is very important here. And I'm gonna go into that in just a second. So water soluble herbicides can be applied, but they need to be applied within minutes of cutting. The reason for this is, is that the uptake tendency in the plant is going to go down after you make that cutting, that you basically killed the plant's vascular system by cutting it off. So you need to make that water soluble application as soon as you've got it cut. Oil soluble herbicides, however, can be applied when you're planning on returning a little bit later. That's because the oil will still soak in effectively down the different channels within the plant. You wanna make sure though, when you apply oil soluble herbicide that you don't get runoff from it. You don't want the stuff dripping off because it's, it's just gonna keep going. It's not gonna stop until it reaches something it's going to affect. Now, again, here's some more information from Ohio State University on what's going to be good for water or oil soluble. And they have a few recommendations here. Uh, the glyphosate recommendation is one of the ones that they're saying to use immediately after doing your cutting. So a water soluble one. Um, whereas you can see that with the triclopyr and 2,4-D combination, they're saying you can mix these with diesel fuel oil or kerosene. Um, there are also, and I typically, I just like using fuel oil or kerosene. You can buy different oil adjutants to use as a carrying agent for these. Um, so make your decisions based on what's going to work out best for you. And don't forget what I was mentioning just a little bit earlier about the potential effects of triclopyr. Note that they've also added picloram here as a potential additive with 2,4-D when you're doing these kinds of applications. By the way, I also want to mention that um, when I send out a link to the recording for this, I'm also going to send out a copy of the slide so you guys can refer back to this um, a little bit later too if you want to. All right, a little bit on basal spraying. This is when you're spraying herbicide with an oil-based carrier to the lower 12 to 18 inches of the plant stem. Now this can be effective, however, it can be a little bit challenging due to that accessibility issue. So you're going to be thinning out any kind of dense areas first before you're really going to be able to do this kind of work. It's also going to be best applied during the dormant season for these plants. They've also added here, again, a little bit more from Ohio State where they've got a combination of triclopyr and imazapyr as one option to use under brand names Garlon 4 and Stalker. You've also got triclopyr by itself and 2,4-D plus triclopyr. And again, you're looking at something that's being used in an oil-based carrier. So one option that I've seen used in other states, and I'm sure it's been used a little bit here in Indiana, is the option of prescribed burning. So prescribed burnings are best used in fire-adapted communities. And we do have several tree communities here in Indiana that are fire-adapted. So it is a potential thing that you can try to use. Um, now, this means, however, that reseeding is very common with Asian bush honeysuckle. So you may need to repeat burns 
several years in a row to get the effect that you're looking for. And if you attempt to do a prescribed burning, the state does require authorization and training for you to be able to do it. And one of the things that you can do is Purdue University does have some experts who do work in this kind of field. And we can um, contact your extension office and potentially make arrangements and try to help you figure out how to do that if it's something you want to pursue. Now, one thing I will say for prescribed burning, uh, that is a part of our natural ecology here in Indiana. So that's not something that I would necessarily turn a blind eye to. Um, it means that you would be restarting the process of succession year after year to try to eliminate these plants. But it also means that you would be allowing a lot of different fire-based uh, plants to reseed and recover and begin growing. You may see native plants that you've never seen before begin to grow in areas that you've done a prescribed burn to. But don't attempt this on your own. It is nowhere near safe to do by yourself. It does require expert knowledge and it requires a lot of planning and a lot of care. So please, if this is something you wanna do, contact your extension office, um, get with your extension educator and let's see what we can do to try to bring it to your area. All right, so I stuck this here because not only do I think it's just cute, um, but also there is a lot of uh, information out there that indicates that the use of grazing animals can actually help control invasives on your property. So uh, sheep and goats sometimes can be rented out depending on the livestock owner and you can use them to eliminate a lot of invasive species. Um, there will be times where goats will actually go after Japanese or Asian bush honeysuckle and they'll just chew them apart. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the plants will be killed, but they will slowly begin to degenerate because they're being stripped of their photosynthetic capacity. So that's something too you might consider if you want to get kind of an easy start to things and maybe see where it can go. But I'm sure there'll be more information published in the future as more people do research on this subject. All right, so here's my contact information. I've got my number for both of my offices up there and my email, as well as links to the Purdue Ed Store and the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. Uh, these, the Diagnostic Lab can help answer questions that you may not be able to solve on, on your own with just identifying disease and other issues going on in your property. And our Ed Store has a lot of publications that can help you learn a little bit more about Asian bush honeysuckle and all kinds of invasive species that you may be dealing with. Okay, so first, thank you guys, and I have stopped our recording.